it was that false perception always bothered me as a skateboarder just because whenever we were out skating anywhere, we, we would get negatively looked at. It was illegal to ride on the sidewalk, illegal to ride in the street. We're in the street. No, we're not. We're in the street. Kids would have to skate like all the way across downtown, past like some of the busiest streets in town just to get down there. They needed a place. Skateboarders, we're a very stubborn breed. We're a breed that gets that smashes ourselves back to back to back to back on, on the concrete. We'll be ble bloody, we'll be bruised, and we just get up and we do it again. There was so much style and influence and uh, like unique things that you could do to express yourself through different tricks. Um, just like even like the graphics and stuff were awesome to me, all the art and the expression that you could have just based on like the stuff that you choose to wear, the things you chose to make your board with, it was just really cool for me. I remember my mom was like saying like, oh there's this place up on uh, University called like Reality Bites or Reality, Reality something and they got some skateboarding stuff up there. When we first went to Reality Check we met Mike and Barb Heights, who are the owners of Reality Check, and they were just really welcoming. They were a family-owned business, but they were family to the whole skating community. Going into Reality Check was like the skateboarding community just opening its arms and just being like, come on, like, you're one of us now. Kind of the idea of what your typical skateboarder is in most people's minds, you know. It was, used to be kind of like a, you know, counterculture sort of rebellion type of idea where, you know, the skater was the kid who didn't care to follow the rules. Oh, that's a sign. That's a sign. <laughs> Read the sign. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Cool. It was that false perception always bothered me as a skateboarder just because whenever we were out skating anywhere, we, we would get negatively looked at. You just can't look at somebody and go, okay, you know, they've got tattoos or they wear a flannel shirt or they have a skateboard uh, underneath their arm and think that they're bad. You know, you, they might be A students. Go like, dang, dang, dude, like I'm a, I'm a straight A student. Like, you know, what the hell? So then we started going, you know, streets and everything, and one of our parents would just drop us off downtown at Town Clock, and we would literally just, just skate everywhere. Because we just didn't really have anything else. Everything is working against you, like not only if the stair has a crack in it, or you have a person that you're constantly, when you walk up to the top of the staircase, looking in the glass doors of the business, just making sure no one's coming out. Like it's just kind of, that's just kind of all built into the street skating experience. And Macalise was built in 1999. And at the time that they were built, cement parks really weren't the thing. Really steep ramps, they used to be wood with holes in them and stuff like that. So when we looked at it, like we didn't really know that it was kind of iffy. Like we were just kind of like, this is crazy and everything was so intimidating. The ramps, like some of them are just placed really odd, so like it's hard to learn there. Almost immediately, um, they were obsolete and dangerous. They got fixed into metal ramps, which are Pretty slippery when they're wet, they're really hot in the summer. The fact that any of us learn how to skateboard using Macaulay's and OG, it baffles me. We didn't have bathrooms. Like no actual access to water. It was nowhere near where any of us lived. Kids would have to skate like all the way across downtown, past like some of the busiest streets in town just to get down there. There was no shade. It was practically the Sahara Desert. Everything about our old park was just saying, Nah. And they needed a place to go. It was illegal to ride on the sidewalk, illegal to ride in the street. They needed a place. What are we being talked to about? Riding in the you street? You will break in the law when you're on the road there. I What's bike in the street. Skateboarding. So we can't skateboard in the street? That's against the law? Why can we bike in the street? Uh, because that's legal. What's your first name? It was pretty like shocking to like see it going away. I felt like you were losing a family member almost in that sense. Like it was a big loss to the community. When we heard that it was closing, it was, it was just that. It was just kind of, it wasn't just a store closing its doors. Like, you know, this is taking the heart of, a, of an entire community and just kind of asking them to kind of find a new home almost. 
Uh, once Hollywood opened, there was a, another way for people to keep stocked up with the shop there, especially Hollywood being an indoor park. We now have somewhere you can go year round. If we didn't have Hollywood when that reality check closed, oh, we probably would have all smashed the panic button. But we were gonna go forward because we knew the need was there. We had an indoor park, but we needed to have a, a decent outdoor park. We eventually started like a petition with the city. We got a bunch of signatures the first time. Um, just trying to kind of make a case for it, show that there's people supporting it. It kind of kept going back and forth and back and forth until about five years ago. Everyone came out. We skated from the town clock to the Carney Scout Public Library. We had all sorts of kids, family members, supporters for our kids group. We filled that room. I mean, there are people that were at leisure, you know, the Parks and Rec and everyone that say like, that was like the most memorable day of my career. And that's when things started to happen. We started to have, um, you know, public input sessions. You had people who were naysayers, and then you had people who were pro skaters coming up with objections and coming up with pluses. We would talk to them very civilly, because we are that. And there was one little old lady, and she specifically said, well, I won't be around here by the time this gets done. But I think the kids should have it. But when I came in today, I didn't think they should. <laughs> It was just hilarious. And the city finally decided, okay, I think we need to do this. Figure out the best location, what, how much space do we have to work with. Eventually, we had the final design and then we had the final dollar amount that we were working with. The city set, finally set aside $600,000. They challenged uh, the skating community to create, to come up with another $200,000. And I think when we found out that we were gonna have to raise $200,000, our hearts sunk. How are we gonna do that? We had shows, music concerts, we had art shows. But then we realized that we were going to have to ask corporate donors and we were gonna to have to go for grants. It was difficult because Kids in Dubuque Skate was not an entity that people knew. They didn't know who we were, what we did. So uh, Kids in Dubuque Skate is a local kind of grassroots organization we started of skaters, supporters, parents. The purpose of Kids was to show that they have us all wrong. Because it wasn't about the money, it was about showing how bad we want it and what we could do to come together. What were we capable of rallying together and overcoming this hardship because a lot of people didn't think that we could. The city puts most of it in, but they also want the private sector to show that they want it as well. The fact that we were able to kind of prove the odds, uh, like disprove the odds, overcome them, and come up with our push, be like, oh yeah, that's the number you want us to hit? All right. After we had so many years of effort and meetings and time, input, all the support, we had to fundraise, and it, it finally came full circle. There were three criteria that were really important that we kept going back to, and that was it needed to be centrally located, it, we needed to have water and restrooms, and we needed to have shade. Once they broke ground, we just wanted it built. So I walked onto the park and I'm like, wow. It's shaped in a way that it naturally transitions. So it's not just, you know, a slab of concrete poured with some ramps thrown on top. Um, it was specifically designed so that there was a flow to it. It's a lot more of kind of like a work of art, a park feature, not uh, afterthought. Count to three. One, two, three. Then we opened everything up and to watch the skaters of all ages work together, it was phenomenal. You know, if you ask them what they thought of skateboarders then versus what they think of them now, <laughs> I'm sure there's a massive difference in what they believe that skateboarders are capable of. I, I was like eight when we started, and I'm 23 and it's finally done. It's there now, we achieved it, maybe not necessarily for us, but for the next generation of kids, the kids that were like us that used to go down to Mackley's and you know, we, we had to work with what we had.